Welcome to OCT, red, yellow, and blue disease. What is real disease and what is physiologically normal? I am Dr. Joseph Salker. I'm going to be your host and I will be uh, participating somewhat. But our main speaker is Dr. Greg Caldwell, a 1995 graduate of the Pennsylvania College of Optometry, where he also completed a one-year residency in primary care and ocular disease. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a diplomat of the American Board of Optometry, and a fellow of the Optometric Glaucoma Society. He is currently in Pennsylvania as an disease consultant, where his primary focus is diagnosis and management of anterior and posterior segment ocular disease, and he has been a participant in multiple FDA clinical investigations. He lectures extensively through the country and the world on ocular disease uh, topics. In 2010, he served as president of the Pennsylvania Optometric Association. And he also served on the Board of Trustees of the American Optometric Association from 2013 to 2016. He's president of the Blair Clearfield Association for the Blind. So with that, we'll give Greg a big virtual welcome and round of applause, and we will get started. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Dr. Saka. I pre truly appreciate it. And guys, we're going to focus on, uh, again, red, yellow, and blue disease here tonight. And this is kind of a very narrow topic, but I think it will help us out with everyday uh, interpretation uh, in our practice. So disclosures here will be, I'm going to mention many products and instruments and companies during the discussion. I have no financial interest in any of these products, instruments, or companies. And I want to jump down here to where I've lectured, Airy, Alcon, Allergan, Biotissue, and OptiView. I have OptiView lit up in red here because I do have an OptiView in my practice. And um, the concepts that I teach tonight can be applied to really any OCT that's out there. So there's just a few proprietary, um, I guess, uh, readings on the OptiView. So with that being said, I'll point that out. but. Basically, I'm going to talk where anyone can apply any of these concepts. Here are my advisory boards, Maculogics, Allergan, Bioscience. I am the medical director for the PA, uh, Pennsylvania, huh, for Involve, PA Medical Director Credentialing Committee, and I am a part owner with uh, Optometric Education Consultants. Joe, polling question number one right off the bat. All right, let me uh, get to it. You caught me flat-footed on that one. So everyone, take a look at this OCT. The red, yellow, and blue areas in this OT, OCT are most likely normal from a disease process, or that's why I'm here. Please help me. So right off the bat, everyone take a look at this GCC. It's flagged as red. We have over here in the GCC map, red, yellow, red and yellow. Jump over here to the thickness map of the retina. We have yellow, we have green, we have blue, and the right eye and the left eye. So is this normal? Is this from disease or help me again? Because that's why I'm here. And Greg, we're trending from, the majority say it's from a disease process. Others are saying, that's why I'm here. Help me learn about this. And the rest are saying that it's normal. Okay, great, perfect. So let's just jump in to red, green, yellow, blue disease, physiologically normal OCT structure. So again, let's just look over things that are just normal. Here's, prob here's one of the things that I've learned over the years is that when you're looking at these OCTs and the norm of the databases, we would think that they're huge, but they're really not. And when it comes to disease, and if you think about disease, and in particular glaucoma or macular degeneration, when you see these in the eye, they're usually asymmetric. Okay, so disease, as you just think about, I say to, um, to my patients all the time, if you think about arthritis, you might have it in both elbows, but in one elbow, it's worse than the other, you know, or, or, you know, knee problems or joint problems. One is usually worse than the other in both, but asymmetric. So when you're looking at these scans, you're going to be sick and tired of me looking at symmetry, reading numbers and so on and so forth. So when you find things that are symmetric, even though they're being flagged as yellow or red or blue, 
then that's a pretty good hint that it's not disease and that it's physiologically normal. It's just an anatomical variation that is normal for that patient, but when it gets plugged into that normative database, they have to draw the line somewhere and then it gets cut off. Now we have a pretty big wellness program in our practice and what I've learned as a hint is that when I look at ganglion cell complexes and I look at them all day long, whether it's glaucoma or in our wellness package that people take is that I kind of have in my head that ganglion cell complex is between 85 and 100 microns. And that's important because there are some ganglion cell complexes out there that are extremely thick, you know, 110, equal on both sides. Well, if that's the case, then that's probably going to start throwing off the thickness maps in the retina. And on top of that, the other way, it could be normal. And it could be just normal for that patient. They could be 80 or 75. Start getting down around that range. You want to make sure it's not a disease process. But again, if they're symmetric, it's probably just a physiological normal. And then that it might throw off the thickness maps as we go through some examples. So again, I like knowing what the GCC is. And I like knowing the symmetry between the eyes. And that right off the bat is probably the best clue or hint I can give you when looking at these. So let's just look at a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a wellness map, which puts pretty much everything on the table. What I like looking at these, I like starting at the GCC. You know, I know in my head between 85 and 100. And when I look at this, I could see that it's 98, 98, 98, 96, 97, 96. Within the eye, there's zero microns difference. And within this eye, it's one microns difference. Going between the eyes, two microns, one micron, and two micron. Now, I think everyone's familiar with how small a micron is, but I just want to review that in two ways. We all have this, we know the size of a millimeter stick. If we take a millimeter, or we all have a millimeter stick, we all know the size of a millimeter. If we take a millimeter and cut it a thousand times, that's a micron. What I like saying to the patients is, hey, slice of bologna, it's about a micron. They kind of laugh and go, yeah, that's, or a slice of bologna, that's about a millimeter, not a micron. Slice of bologna, about a millimeter thick. Okay, doc, I didn't know what a millimeter is, but I know what a slice of bologna. How about if I gave that back to the delicatessen person and said, hey, can you slice that for me another thousand times? Realize how thin that would be. That's a micron and the patients can wrap their mind around. So I like looking at symmetry, and again, and we're looking at GCC, I like for this to be in about 10 microns. Once I get about 10 microns, I start scratching my head. 15 microns, I gotta really figure out what's going on. That's kind of my two numbers that I use. Now here's one of those proprietary uh, OptiView uh, uh, numbers that are out here, one of these fields. This focal loss volume is very, very good for predicting glaucoma. This global loss volume, just kind of tells you the general health of the of the ganglion cell. But if you look here, 89, 86, between that 85 and 100, nice and green, nice and green, it goes to this scale here. Green is good, yellow is caution, red is bad. Now, with that being said, let's go over to the retina maps because the retina can swell or it can atrophy. So that's why they put green in the middle here. If it's in the middle and it's above this or yellow or red, and these numbers are lighting up yellow and red, what it's saying is that we are thicker than average. And if it's blue, it's thinner than average because we know that the retina can swell or it can atrophy. Now, when I look at this one, just take a look between this one here. This is superior. There's 286, 283. So that's three microns, 314, 311, three microns. 259, 259, zero microns. I'm not going to read the, last, the rest to you, but you can see if you go down and compare down, that is very, you can see very symmetric within about five microns. Now here's the key. Make sure you go inside, nasal to nasal, 309 here to 311 here, and make sure you go nasal to nasal and temporal to temporal, because if you go here to here, you're know, like, ooh, that, that's off. You want to go temporal 298 to this uh, temporal over here, 300, and you'll see that they're all within a few microns, very symmetric. 
Now, this here is a wellness scan of, uh, of an angiography, and I'm not going to get too much into angiography tonight, but again, I use symmetry at the foveal avascular zone here because this is how we can pick up some of the earliest changes in diabetic retinopathy, and I might have an example, but we want to kind of focus on the traditional OCT B scan. This is called the B scan OCT up here, and then maybe we'll do another course on angiography at some point. So here's a 46-year-old woman with red and yellow disease. She's 46, minus three quarters, minus one and a quarter, 2020, thyroid dysfunction, cholesterol. Uh, she has medications for those above conditions and her IOPs are 15 uh, millimeters of mercury at 8.30 a.m. So here is her scans whenever we look at her. And look how scary these, these are here, all lighting up red, all lighting up red. You know, is this normal? Is this abnormal, physiologic? What's, you know, is there a disease process? Let me put them side by side. And this is why I like looking at the GCC first. Remember, 85 to 100 is what I use in my head. Look at this patient here coming in at 110, 111, 110. 110, 109, 111. I can tell you, I look at GCCs all day long. You usually don't see them like that, but they can be. And when you see that here, that tells me, okay, they have a little bonus. You know, I say to the patient, hey, look, when this opens up, these should be between 85 and 100. Oh, look, you're at 110. Anything above 100, I'm not like, oh my gosh, now, you know, what am I going to do? How am I going to get myself out of this? Hey, anything above 110, that's bonus for you. Look, no glaucoma and a very healthy GCC. That's what this is. This is a glaucoma scan. This is just the overall general health. Now, what does that do? It translates into this. Look how red this is. Remember, green is in the middle. Yellow and red mean thicker than average, and blue means thinner than average. Well, is it disease? Well, let's quickly go up here and look. I'm looking at the... Uh, RPE right here where my pointer is. We can see the ellipsoid zone and then nuclear body, plexiform layer, nuclear body, plexiform layer, ganglion cells, nerve fiber layer. I don't see anything that should be caused as in a sense edema or uh, epiretinal membranes as in this scan here, right? You could see the red disease that has occurred. If you look at all these scans, you can see the amount of edema or traction that's going on. And you would be able to look and see, hey, there's a disease process going on. There's a hot spot right here. Or the same thing that's happening in this scan here with this epiretinal membrane and the fluid that the traction and the fluid that's building up. And this would be an indication of why this potentially could be red. But look at the symmetry between these two eyes, 330, 329, 359, 364, 293, 294. So symmetry, symmetry, symmetry. And this red and yellow disease is absolutely normal for this patient and just comes about because this patient just has an abnormal GCC, which is great because I don't know of too many disease processes that we have to worry about that the patient has too much ganglion cell complex. Here's a patient here, 63-year-old woman with red, yellow, blue, and green disease. Plano, pretty much sense, minus, minus 50, plus 2, 2020. IOPs are pretty normal via Goldman from 2011 to 2017. So where do I like to start? I like starting at the ganglion cell, 85 to 100. All right, here's 83, 81, 85. 81, 81, 82. Within the eye, four microns different, one micron different, and then over here, two, between the eyes, two, zero, and three. Again, I scratch my head getting concerned when we start reaching 10 microns difference in that asymmetry or symmetry uh, type of uh, number. So here, even though these are thinner than average, I'm starting to say, well, looks pretty normal to me. I don't see a disease process. Come down here, doc, it's not from glaucoma. This one's just saying, hey, there's just a general thinning of the, of the patient's GCC. It's not from glaucoma. It's just a general thinning. And here it's just saying, that's eh, pretty healthy, and it's not from glaucoma. But when you come up here and you start looking at the ganglion cell map, you can see here there's a little bit of yellow and maybe something trying to show up here, but yellow and yellow. 
And as almost if I would just fold this in half, it almost becomes almost like a perfect ink blot or a similar ink blot. But let's look at these numbers. 254, 254, 296, 299, 63 to 54, and 291 to 291. Getting close to that 10 micron, or it, it, you know, it slightly is over, but when you go and you look at to see if there's anything going on, I don't see any process. So we just said, you know what? This yellow, red, blue disease is, is totally normal. Now look at this one here, guys. Point this out. Look how this is blue. Two, six, five, and over here, two, six, five, green. I've discussed this with the programmers, and there's more than just that number. It's a whole volume set. So this one gets triggered as being normal, and this one gets triggered as being abnormal, and it's the same number. And then you drop down here, two microns makes a difference because 246 makes it blue. So very symmetric. I would not be too concerned with disease. So this patient comes back a year later. Here it is right here, 12, 7, 15, 12, 22, 16. Even more symmetric now. If you would just draw this line folded in half, but we always start with the GCC, 81, 81, 82, one micron difference, 81, 81, 81, zero difference, one micron difference. It's saying, Doc, it's not glaucoma. It's just an overall general thinning of this patient. And then if you just look at all the numbers of the retina, they are all within microns of each other. Remember, going nasal to nasal and temporal to temporal. So here's a classic case. I showed you one where the GCC was really, really thick and it threw off everything. And here's a case where the GCC is really, really thin. And this is throwing off making the other one was red on the ret retinal thickness maps. This one's blue on the on the retina thickness maps. So here's a 58 year old woman with yellow disease plus one with a uh, 2020 uh, visual acuity. IOPs are 13 and 15. Pay attention here to the focal loss volume and global loss volume. So when we start to look, I like, let's see if I have them put together. Yeah. So when I look at these, I like looking at the ganglion cell complex. I like looking to see here, they're saying, hey, there's some thinning, There's, but it's not from glaucoma, it's just a general thinning, that's how you read this. And then I just wanted to, before I animated that slide, just take a look, there is a little bit of, this is a vitreomacular adhesion. This is not a vitreomacular traction, this is the new terminology. Everyone out there has vitreomacular adhesions. Our, our vitreal face is up against our retina, and then it becomes more visible as we age. And this would be a broad-based uh, vitreal macular adhesion because there's no traction. You'll see that in a second. I dropped the slide in a little bit earlier on this um, before starting the presentation. But let's go back and let's take a look at what we're trying to do here. If you look, 82, 82, 81. One micron, 81, 81, 81. Uh, zero microns. And again, uh, one micron, one micron, very symmetric, very thin. This is a different patient than what we just had before, saying focal loss volume is normal, but the ganglion uh, cell loss is, uh, um, uh, is, is, is thinner than average. Now, remember, that goes to this. Green is good, yellow is caution, red is bad. Green is in the middle. Oh, everything looks good here, even though this is thin because this could have been blue, but it's green. And this is green here, and things look pretty symmetric when you come over and you look at the retina maps. And then you come up and you say, okay, I see a little bit of vitreomacular adhesions going on with this patient. And no other really workup needed for glaucoma because of the symmetry and the normal pressures that were there. Here's a 40-year-old man with red, blue, and green disease. A little higher myope here. Look at the minus 750, a little bit of cylinder. Pressures are normal with Goldman, uh, 15 and 13 uh, at uh, 6.30 p.m. So let's see, if do I have them? Nope, these aren't together. So let's take a look at these individually. This is the right eye. This is the left eye. I like looking at the ganglion cell complex first. 80, 78, 82, 80, 78, 81, zero microns, zero microns, one micron different between the, the right and left eyes. Symmetric, between that 85 and 100, thinner but symmetric. Even 
the instrument is saying it's thin, guys, but it's not really focal. Remember, glaucoma usually drills down in their same arcuate patterns. That's why they go with focal. And it's just a general thinning. This is a higher myope. Remember the minus seven. I see that quite a bit in these higher myopes. It's just a general thinning that's going on with this patient. And when you look at these numbers between the right and that left eye, look at this, 257, 257, 258. I'm sorry, 285, 285, 252 to 250. Look at the symmetry that's here. This is yellow. This is red. There's blue. But this is physiologically normal. There's really not a disease process going on. You go up and you take a look at the patient's retina and things just look great. You don't see the atrophy. You see all the layers that are going on uh, for this patient. So here's 2015. We bring the patient back. This is two years later. Boy, did I miss glaucoma? Did I miss something? No. Look how symmetric things are again. And the focal loss volume, global loss volume, look at you could see here that the, the ganglion cell map being red and, and yellow and green are all looking about the same. And here they are 22 months apart. Here's the 2015. Here's the 2017. You certainly could do a change analysis, but I just have the printouts here. You could take a look at the numbers 80, 87, 80, 82, 80, 77, and 83, all within a micron of each other from uh, March of 2015 to January of 2017. Again, a lot of yellow, a lot of red, a lot of blue, but hopefully the symmetry, knowing the GCC, this is going to help you determine what is true disease or what is physiologically normal. So now let's go back to this. Joe, we have a polling question. This is that same exact one that we started off with. And it, ladies and gentlemen that are out there, look, 77, 77, 77, 77, 78, 77, 0, 0, 0 1, and 0, 0, and 1. One micron difference. The red, yellow, and blue areas in this OCT are most likely normal. From a disease process, or I have a better understanding. Thanks for helping me. Take a look here at the blue. It's blue. It's almost as if you can fold it in half, all within microns of each other. Now, I am going to point out there's a little RPE scar going on here. There's something going on. But is this yellow, red, green, blue, is this all being thrown off by this? No, there's an RPE scar going on here uh, from something. Uh, but is this a glaucoma patient? It's saying, hey, doc, look, it's pretty thin, but it's also globally thin, too. Joe, how's our results looking? Well, the vast majority say normal, but you did distract people to a, 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 another, a, another area and said, I have a better understanding. Thanks for helping me. I think people didn't know what to, uh, what, you know, what, what is the best answer, and both are, are good answers. Right. So A and C are good, right? Normal or the people out there that want to say, hey, thanks for the help, you're welcome. So that's, uh, that's this patient here, but now I want to go through it in a little bit more detail. So here's the patient here, and what I want to point out is when I was looking at this, this, this patient had a bad scan right here. This is a bad scan, and you can kind of see this little kind of area here, how it's translated into this. And when you look at these, these progression analysis or change over time, a lot of people ask, well, what are these gray boxes? Well, these are your confidence intervals. So it's not, a, you'd like to see those a little bit tighter, especially at the ganglion cell, because with the ganglion cell, the patient's looking right at it, at their macula. Getting a confidence interval on a nerve fiber layer, patient has to look off a little bit. Maybe the, the, the confidence aren't so tight. I don't like this scan, but as we get a few more, what will happen is I'll delete this one out. And look right here, you can see the signal index was 34, and this is 73, 73, again, 34, 73, and 73. This is just a bad scan, but why I wanna point that out is look where it put this dot. And if we would then get rid of this dot, look at how you would trend a little bit flatter and a little bit flatter. So you have to look at the scans. You can't always think that the scan was perfect uh, by your technician. 
um, especially in 2018, this might have been a newer uh, uh, OCT. We've been through about four OCTs in the practice because, as you know, they're like computers. They keep getting better and better, and we just upgrade with the technology. So this is just a bad scan on this eye. But this is that 79-year-old woman that we've been following. She's had this little RPE scar all along here. And you can see that her foveal thickness over time is staying the same, her macular volume. So she has all this red and yellow and blue disease, but it's not really disease. It's physiologically normal for her. And you can see here there's a little bit tighter confidence intervals on, uh, on this scan here. And the ganglion cell is usually a little bit tighter because they're looking right at it with their macula. So these confidence intervals are a little bit tighter and you can see that over the course from uh, 2018 through, uh, 2000, for, through 2020, August of this year, you can see she's stable. But she has all this red and yellow disease, all this red and yellow disease. But again, that was the first scan that we started with at the very beginning. And then I just shared it again with the poll, the second poll, she was, abnormally thin. She was 78 and 77 in her ganglion cell complex, but that was just totally normal for her, and she's not progressing over time. And here's just another scan just showing you again how stable things are over time. Here's a 28-year-old man with myopia. So 28, you know, how many diseases could be out there? You know, I guess, you know, as many as you want, I guess, but it's not, you know, as we know, as we get older, the more likelihood of retinal disease kind of increases, especially those vitreomacular tractions. So there's a nice little red spot right here and a real red spot right here that captures my eye. But let's take a look. Let's go in the order that I like to go in. This gives me an idea. 85 to 100. I usually see them about 92. So the ganglion cell is a little bit thicker than what we see, but it's not abnormally thick like that 110. Four microns different, one micron difference, one, four, and uh, one, one, and four. So nothing really too crazy going on here, allowing these to be normal, saying not glaucoma, and the general health of it is, is rather good. Green is good, yellow is cross, and red is bad. Now we jump over to here, and we see red is thicker than average. Boom, thicker than average. But it's within four microns. So let's go up and take a quick look. Any epiretinal membranes, any fluid, any traction, anything going on with this 28-year-old with myopia, um, this is just an abnormally normal red. So it's uh, physiologically being flagged. It's just without, just outside the uh, you know the normative database, and it's calling our attention to go up and take a look, and we can see that everything is is normal. Joe, I know you do a lot of OCTs and a lot of teaching over the years. There's Before I move into some green, red, and blue disease, showing the real disease, any comments um, that you want to add um, to what I said? Uh, that may be some uh, pearls of wisdom or move on. No, I, I think uh, I think you, you're coming at very, very well, Greg. You're looking at the at the pure OCT. I like to look at the OCT and some other clinical findings and, and see how they can support one another or refute one another. I think we can probably talk about that in just a short bit. Perfect. So let's jump into now applying some of these to see if we can pick up that, that real disease that out here. All right, we just saw a 28-year-old myo. How about this 34? How about this 30-year-old woman comes in? Hey, I just need my contact lens prescription updated. We have this wellness program at our practice, so we run it on her and then we look at her. And all of a sudden, now we come down here and we see all this yellow and red, and it's being flagged here as yellow and red. And then over here, now look, 12, 15, 9 difference. So as we look at that, and we're seeing here that the focal loss volume and the global loss volume. So, you know, where's the issue? Is this thin? Is this thick? We don't know. We have to study the scan, right? So let's go over here and take a look. Well, this is being flagged as 319. Well, remember, we've been looking at these long now. We've just been seeing 254, 260, 222. You know, about, it's about a quarter of a micron um, is in my head, 250, 260. I look at these all day long right here. I would say that this is probably the abnormal one. 
So let's go up and take a look. If I go up here and take a look, well, well, this is something's going on. And if we go through the scans, we have a vitreo macular traction going on here. Whoever would have thought a 30 year old person coming in saying, hey, I just need my contact lenses updated. Now she doesn't really notice it because you can see here this ellipsoid zone, this ellip that, that which is nothing more that lights up bright white. So the bright white at the bottom here is the RPE. The next one up is part of the photoreceptor that has the largest amount of mitochondria in it. And they call that the ellipsoid zone of the photoreceptor. Right above that is the myoid zone. That's kind of like your Golgi apparatus and all the different structures that are in there. But since the mitochondria is so tightly packed, that's what we used to call the inner and outer segments. So the bright line above, the right, the bright, so you got the RPE, the bright line there, that's your uh, uh, ellipsoid zone. That's the mitochondria. There's a little uh, bright, um, a dark spot or hypo above that. That's your myoid zone. And then there's always the external limiting my membrane. So external limiting membrane, part of the photoreceptors, the myoid zone, the ellipsoid zone, and then the outer segments. And then you get into the RPE. And the reason why she's seeing so well is because her ellipsoid zone is still pretty much or where the photoreceptors are intact. But she's got this focal broad, or this focal vitreomacular traction. And so I would probably repeat this just to see if this is a bad scan because this macula looks pretty good. So that's how you can see here that the, the that 10, 15 microns start scratching your head, two thir or 313 to 265, start scratching your head, start looking at the exams, and you can see here that this patient has a vitreomacular traction. This is the slide that I dropped in here. This is a great reference. It's in your handout. Um, oh, you know what? It's not in your handout. I apologize because I just put this in after making the handout. So the, for you out there that want to write this down, the International Vitreomacular Traction Study Group Classification. Um, it was out in 2013. And what it has done is when you read your letters um, from your ophthalmologist or your retinologist, um, you'll see that sometimes it's maybe the old nomenclature and sometimes it's a new nomenclature from this 2013. So they classify things as vit vitreomacular adhesions and vitreomacular tractions and define them as 1,500 microns as a broad base and then anything less than the microns is a focal. And that's what's kind of all in this slide here, focal versus broad, 1,500 microns. And that's important because you can see here, you can have a vitreomacular adhesion. Remember, everyone out there, unless you had a, a posterior vitreal detachment, all of us have vitreomacular adhesion. And then it starts to lift up and you can see it. And it could be, as you can see here, focal or broad. But when you get down to the focal or, or you get down to the focal or broad vitreomacular tractions, the focal ones you want to watch a little closer. They're the ones that can then lead into the macular holes, focal and broad based. And what we're talking about is this base right here, this focal and broad base. This is a little bit broader and this is a little bit more focal. Now these are both focal because they're both under 1500 microns, but which one has a, has a worse prognosis? Well, this one's more focal and you can actually see what's happening down here to the ellipsoid zone. It's starting to open up, potentially turning into a macular hole. So this broad and focal is pretty important. Little taste of the retinal. Uh, OCT course that's coming up in a few weeks. Now let's get back to uh, to this, Lord, we can we find disease by doing this these these techniques that I was talking about. Here's a 72 year old man, cataract check, 104, 103, 105, 107, 106, 108. A little bit above normal, right? 85 to 100, but you could see very symmetric, two microns, two microns, three microns, three microns, three microns, not glaucoma and not even uh, that uh, thin, uh, nice, healthy globally with that global loss volume. This looks good, this looks good, but then you jump over here, now you got it saying, hey, it's thicker than average. Well, it's not thicker than average based on the GCC because then they both would be flagged. And you have, two thir or you have 330 here and 356, that's a 26 micron difference. We're used to looking at these, 250, 260, in this case, 283, looking pretty normal, 234, why, what's going on here? And if you look real close, 
you can see that epiretinal membrane. And that epiretinal membrane is creating some traction, making that retina 26 to 30 microns thicker. And that's your disease process in this eye. So this was a gentleman coming in for a cataract check. Now, if we check them maybe with uh, contrast sensitivity, you might get a little bit difference. But this person, based on the RPE, right here is that ellipsoid zone where that mitochondria are. Right above it is the other part of the photoreceptor, that myoid region down below it where it's another hypo. That's your outer segments, your externally limiting membrane. Everything's intact here. This cataract, if, if it's not big, this patient can see 2020. Now they might cover their eyes and say, well, this left eye is a little blurrier. Contrast sensitivity would probably pick it up. But on a, on a Snelling chart, this is going to be 2020, and that's going to be 2020. So let's take a look at uh, this epiretinal membrane. This is the on FOSS right here. I've clicked on this button, and we're looking at the on FOSS. You could just see all the wrinkles that are occurring. You could see the epiretinal membrane here. And you can just see how large, patients love this, I kind of show them, look how large this cellophane maculopathy that we call it, right? Or this epiretinal membrane that has grown across the surface. Look how large it is. And it's not really creating too much distortion to the vasculature. And you can see, again, this is just another scan of what we can see here with what's going on with the, with the kind of the puckering of it. And you can see what's happening with this retina and how it's ringing. But again, the patient has a nice healthy macula and the photoreceptors are intact and they're probably gonna have a pretty good acuity. Here's a 63 year old woman with diabetes. And what we wanna look at again is start here. Everything looks normal, nice and symmetric, three, four, two, zero, zero. This looks healthy. See a little hot spot right here or a little thin spot here, but nothing It's kinda, another little thin spot here. So nothing's really causing me any heartburn. I come over here and take a look. And again, we have thinning. These are thicker than average, but this is saying thinner here. So now let's take a look at what I must have something hidden here. Here's the, the, uh, the vascular part of this. This is why anyone out there that has OCT, I think you'll transition to OCTA. Because if you take a look now at the foveal vascular zone, remember this falls upon those same principles. It should be symmetric. And the number that I use down here is 0 0.1. They're always in healthy individuals that I've seen within 01, 02, 03, you know, 09. This one's 0 0.22. This breaks that rule of 0 0.1. Look at the foveal avascular zone. It's avascular here. But when you get out to the to this, this donut ring, it looks pretty healthy. There's a little bit of dropout. Remember, this patient has diabetes. But look what's happening here. And remember, this is one of the earliest places where maybe diabetes can be picked up now because it's the thinnest part of the capillaries in the retina. And you can see that there is dropout within this region, this foveal vascular zone is starting to expand. You're not really seeing much diabetic retinopathy, probably a couple of little hot spots right here. You're not going to see, you know, a dot hemorrhage, a microaneurysm, cotton wool spots, Irma, you know, four, two, one rule. I call those the macro changes in diabetic retinopathy. We can pick up some micro changes now. Here's a broad base vitreomacular adhesion, right? We don't have to really worry about the adhesions. It's the vitreomacular tractions that we have to have to be concerned about. This is asymmetric, but due to diabetic retinopathy. And that's what's happening in this area right here. Notice how this thinning is being picked up down here now, and you have a reason because the capillary dropout from this patient's diabetic retinopathy. Loving my angiography for patients with diabetes. And here's a closer look at that left eye. Look at the dropout that's occurring in this capillary bed. Look at this, the holes that's occurring to this, uh, to this foveal vascular zone. Here's the foveal vascular. Look how it's expanding because of the capillaries that are dying out here in this region. So really cool technology with this angiography. Now, I didn't want to say, you know, hey, we got to have all these angiographies. I can tell you I find more diabetic retinopathy with angiography, but anytime I have someone with diabetes, I quickly open up and I look at the foveal vascular zone because I want to know what's going on. And this one falls within that limit I was telling you about, 0 0.10. This is 04. Who must be out of the woods. But then we go up and we take a look and I see a red spot. 
And let's take a look at the gang in South Complex, 90, 97, 97, 99, 97. All looking good, all looking good. Green, green, okay, we can get away from that. 285, we've been looking at these. These are starting to look normal. Why is this one 314? We come up here, and all of a sudden now, take a look. You see this hyper-reflective area. This is where those capillaries are in diabetic retinopathy. If you're looking for diabetic retinopathy, you want to look just inside this inner retina or just inside the outer retina, right where the inner and outer retina come together. That's where that superficial and deep plexi are. And you can see here there's fluid. You don't know if it's plasma or, you know, like a plasma-like fluid or is it blood? Or is, that, or is this here lighting up hyper? Is that blood or is that exudate? You have to look with the 90 and 78s to be able to tell. But that's what the hyper is. It's either exudate or or blood, and this hypo area is just a pocket full of fluid. But it could have been missed here if I just solely rely on foveal vascular zone, and you can see what's happening here and why this is being flagged. So again, it's that asymmetry that's between the eyes. That one's 30 microns of asymmetry. Here's an advanced interpretation of a green disease. Let's take a look. Now, I say that is because, take a look at this. Here's 110, 109, 110 within one micron. I'm getting a little skeptical here. I'm scratching my head. It's green, but it's 11 microns. Look here, 12 microns. But, man, it's, it's, it's green. It's got to be good, right? It's got to be, yeah, this, you got to talk yourself out. There's nothing going on. Look at the foveal loss volume. Look at these numbers. Then you start coming over here and taking a look, and you start scratching your head. You're starting to get uh, 247, 253, here's 223, going to inside, 214, 207, outside to outside here. I don't like that. Look at that, 232 to 307. And what's happening here, if you look, and this is why this one's a little tricky, there's an epiretinal membrane, but look at this surface here. This is a bilateral epiretinal membrane on this patient. And if you turn on the ONFOS and take a look, I'm clicking this little button here on the OCT, the ONFOS. All OCTs have ONFOS. You could see the wrinkling that has occurred to this patient's right eye. And you could see it right across the surface right here of, of the retina. And you can see the epiretinal membrane right here across the surface of the right eye. And again, here it is. Here's another picture of the right eye, just another angle that I've cut through. And then we go to the left eye, you can certainly see the epiretinal membrane across the surface here. And again, clicking on this button and looking at the ONFOS. So this one here is a little tricky because this patient is green, bilateral green, maybe not so much that total asymmetric, but it's because they have bilateral disease. But again, it's worse in one eye than the other. Going back to support some of the, you know, some of the pearls to use when interpreting an OCT, and you can see this is the left eye, another scan of that epiretinal membrane. With that being said, Joe, I know you always like to have a few great pearls on OCT. Um, I dropped these slides in there. Would you like for me just to click and tell me when to click and talk about them? <clears throat> sure, Greg. There are, uh, there, there are terms we've been using, red, yellow, green disease, and I, I think we all have come to accept them in our casual professional lexicon. But just in case the people are, are, are not aware, green disease is a, a an insidious clinical entity. This is a, a glaucomatous process masquerading really as non-disease. and It's going to afflict inexperienced clinicians who are over-relying on their technology to make the uh, diagnosis for them. It's debilitating for the patient and painful for the uh, provider, but it can be a boon for malpractice attorneys. And this was published in the Journal of Irre Irreproducible Results and Sense of Studies in 2015 by that, foreign, uh, that renowned researcher, Dr. N.S. Sherlock, who usually concentrates on things that are incredibly obvious. Greg, slip ahead. Here is a patient we saw in our, they're seen in our general care clinic when I was at the university. And he had been a 56 year, he's a 56 year old male who had been a glaucoma suspect for about, since about 2012. His pressure peaked at about 32, but he ran in the low to mid, uh, low to mid 20s. You can see that his cup to disc ratio varied by, by 
depending on who was uh, assessing him. Gonioscopy was open. Pachymetry wa wa was very average. And he sat as a glaucoma suspect coming back every six months. Greg, do you want to jump ahead? And here is an OCT. And what we can see in the, in the thickness map, and this is a cirrus, you can see in the very top, the thickness map had a very, very robust uh, nerve fiber layer in each eye. But what draws your attention is the large area of red superior temporal in the uh, in the left eye. And you really have to have to pay attention to that. It is flagged on the quadrants and the clock hours as being statistically uh, abnormal. Now when we go over to the corresponding ganglion cell complex, everything falls within the normative data range in both eyes. But the left ganglion cell complex may be a little bit less robust than the right, and it could certainly correspond to what we see in that left nerve fiber layer. The nerve, uh, the nerve fiber layer looks very good in the right eye. There, there's an inferior temporal small area of borderline statistical significance in the right eye. The left eye, everything falls within the normative database uh, in the ganglion cell complex. So when we look at this, we have to consider that we have very much a suspicious nerve fiber layer uh, and possibly getting in the cell complex in the left eye. And Greg, if you go ahead. And when I look at, when I saw the patient, fortunately, fo um, there, there, you know, I took photos. And, I, and as I look in the left optic nerve and nerve fiber layer, uh, that left superior temporal area, the nerve is absolutely fine. There's, there's no focal defects of the, uh, of the neuroretinal rim or nerve fiber layer. But if you go inferior temporal on the right eye, what you see is a large wedge defect that corresponded to that very, very small defect on the OCT. And what showed up as abnormal in the OCT is physiologically normal on this patient. So this is a classic example of a person who had red disease in his left eye and actually green disease in his right eye. If you step back one, one please, Greg. When we look at the, the quadrant and the thickness maps, which are red in the left eye, the, uh, the, the quadrant and the clock hours, understand that when this anatomy is measured, that's a lot of territory that's being averaged together. And when that happens, you can actually have things that are that are normal or that are abnormal that can come up as, as normal. And that's really what happened mostly in the in mid eye. You know, it's borderline statistical significance. But there's a lot of territory being averaged in there. So we can advance to Greg. And we look at his visual fields that have been collected and, and, and reviewed by different people over, over several years. We can see that there is a corresponding func uh, functional abnormality, but the left eye, which was more suspicious on OCT, really was uh, actually normal. We can advance, Greg. And another example of, of green disease, when we look at the neurofiber layer on, the, on, this, uh, on this opti view, there's a faint inferior temporal defect in the photographs. And we can see a small wedge defect, inferior temporal in the right eye. The ganglion cell complex doesn't really match in the right eye, and certainly the neurofiber layer doesn't show up uh, on this device as being statistically abnormal. And that's because small defects can actually be clinical, be uh, objectively missed by these devices. Advanced, Greg? And yet another example of a person we can see clearly there's an inferior temporal defect uh, on the photograph. And we go and take a look at it on the, uh, on the OCT. The, the nerve fiber layer thickness map is pretty robust right and left eye, maybe more robust right eye compared to left, but everything falls in that inferior temporal zone on the left eye is within the normative database. And as I said earlier, there's a lot of anatomic area being averaged in. When that happens, something that is abnormal can fall within that average and, and not trigger the normative database to let you know there's anything wrong here. Go ahead, Greg. 
and yet another example of a person who's got clearly glaucoma, has an inferior temporal defect uh, in, in the left eye, and we take a look at it on the cirrus in the lower right, the thickness map maybe show a li shows me a little something, but it really doesn't, uh, doesn't show anything statistically abnormal. The ganglion cell complex uh, on the cirrus uh, also is coming within the normative database. And when I use a spectralis, you know, that area still is falling within the normative database. So here's a person that everything is green, we think is good, but when we look at the patient clinically, we see that they are not good. Go ahead, Greg. And you know, red and green doesn't become brown. Here's a patient who's got an inferior temporal defect on the nerve fiber layer. It's right about where your, your, your pointer is. And it is there, it is faint. And when we take a look at it, moving ahead, on the spectralis, everything falls within green, but if you notice, there is an area that does fall into the red outside normal limits, but it's, a not, an, it's not enough to trigger the normative database. It still is being printed in green. Go ahead, Greg. And now looking at this patient on the, on the cirrus, we can actually see on the upper, in the upper left, in that right eye, there's an inferior temporal defect. We can actually see on the thickness map, and it shows up well on the deviation map below it. But when we go to the statistical norms of the quadrant clock hours, it is clearly within normal limits. And we know the patient's not normal. And when we go over to the ganglion cell complex, the left eye looks very good, but you have that very sharp cut in the right eye at the horizontal raffae, or what I like to call a nautilus shell. And on this device, on the ganglion cell complex, when I see a, a sharp horizontal cut, respecting the horizontal raffae and giving me this nautilus shell appearance, that is very compelling. And this is a patient who Despite things, of course, the gang and cell complex does fall outside normal limits, but the nerve fiber layer doesn't. So we have to really look at not only the objective findings, but the functional findings, and don't forget the photographic and clinical assessment of these patients as well. I think that's it, Greg. And as we can see that these are continuous defects, you know, the, the effect of the bun archer bundle going from the parapapillary area right through to the, the macular zone, that horizontal cut, that pseudo nautilus shell appearance to me on this device has always been very, very compelling for early disease. I think that might be it I have. And that's it. So I'm going to thank everyone uh, for coming. Joe, have you been able to watch the questions there? Uh, thank everyone for coming. Uh, uh, OCT, red, yellow, and blue disease, what is real and what is physiologically normal? I think we have time if there's any questions in the chat box. Uh, no, actually, I, uh, we had a few comments that I responded to privately. Otherwise, I think people were, were more intent on, on listening, and I don't see a lot, of, uh, a lot of questions in here. So I think we're actually uh, doing quite well. Perfect. So again, I thank everyone uh, for, th for coming uh, and attending uh, OCT Red, Yellow, and Blue Disease, what is real and what is, what is real disease and what is physiologically normal.